Well, hello, Storyline, wherever you happen to be around the world, and a special hello to Storyline Eugene, Storyline North Atlanta, and other groups around the world that are pulling together from week to week to explore the Word of God with us here on Storyline Online. Listen, the Bible is full of provocative mysteries. And when we uncover the answers to those mysteries, beautiful things emerge. We are presently engaged in a series of questions regarding the character of God. Last week, we posed the question, is God an egomaniac? And it's a justifiable question because scripture is full of declarations to the effect that all attention is to be on God, that he is to be praised and worshiped. And we wondered out loud, is this because God has some kind of inherent insecurity and needs his ego to be stroked by mere creatures for all eternity? Well, today we're going to ask the question, is God on a power trip? This is also a justifiable question because for many people, the first concept or word or notion that comes to mind when they think of God is the idea of power, that God is defined for many people as sheer power, as total power, as absolute power. And scripture is full of language that would lend itself to an understanding of God that is intimately associated with the idea of power. For example, in the book of Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1, when God introduces himself to Abram, a man who later in the story becomes Abraham and is a very familiar character throughout the biblical narrative, here in this introduction, we have a articulation of God as being deeply associated with power. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am, I am almighty God. Notice the language in the introduction. I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. God is not just mighty, according to this scripture, according to this introduction to Abram, this human being who's having an encounter with God. God isn't merely mighty. God is almighty. And then throughout the book of Genesis, repeatedly over and over again, this term, God Almighty, occurs. There are five times in particular that in the book of Genesis, God is portrayed as the epicenter of all might and power. So God is powerful according to scripture. But then after we come through the book of Genesis and we encounter God as almighty, we come to the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, in which we encounter an interesting development. In Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, God spoke to Moses and said to him, notice this, you guys, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. This is referring directly back to the scripture we just read in Genesis 17, where God appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty. That was the introduction. That's how God described himself to Abram. Well, to Moses, God says, hey, Moses, I am that God who appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But, now there's a qualification, but by my name, Lord, which is Yahweh, in the Hebrew, I was not known to them. I want you to notice something here that scripture very clearly articulates a progressive revelation of God that is underway. Abram encounters God with the abstract idea of power, God Almighty, but Moses encounters God by a name. Now tuck this away for just a moment because we're going to come back to this transition, to this developmental or progressive revelation of God's identity in just a moment. But let's continue noticing the usage of the word power in relation to God's identity. 
David, for example, in Psalm 62 and verse 11 says, God has spoken once, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. That power belongs to God. So here again, we have this idea that God possesses might, all might, and that power belongs to God. Power is an interesting word, especially with regards to theology, but in general, it is a fascinating word to unpack. The word itself, power, if you just look it up in the dictionary, simply means to be able. Well, to be able to what? Well, to be able to do things. It is the capacity of causation. That is, the capacity to cause things to happen. The ability to make things happen. But I want to just put on the table for you as we develop the idea that under certain circumstances, power is revealed in the capacity not to act. That is to say, power is sometimes revealed in self-control, to possess the power to do something and to choose to refrain from doing that thing is sometimes a greater manifestation of power. Well, how powerful is God? David says, as we just read, that power belongs to God. To Abram, God introduced himself as almighty God. How powerful is God? Well, when we fast forward to the end of the Bible, to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, we have this kind of language. Alleluia, and these are the angelic beings of heaven that are praising God, and they say salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. God is the possessor of power. How much power? Well, in chapter 19, verse 6, that was chapter 19, verse 1. In chapter 19, verse 6 of Revelation, Alleluia, for the Lord our God omnipotent reigns. Now we have an interesting word that portrays God as possessing not merely power, but all power. Omne is all, and power or potence is equivalent to power in the Greek. So, so we often speak of the omnipotence of God, the, the fact that God is in possession of the totality of all power. But this creates an immediate problem, a philosophical problem, a theological problem, and in fact, a relational problem between us and God. And it is sometimes referred to as the omnipotence paradox. Now, flesh this out with me, just think it through, track with me as we open up this paradox that presents itself to us the moment we have the idea of omnipotence on the table, right? So sometimes, in a kind of simplistic way, the idea of omnipotence is toyed with, it's played with by philosophers and thinkers in general with posing a series of questions. Is God so powerful, since he's all powerful, that he could create a square circle? Well, you hear the tension, the paradox in the proposition. Is God so powerful that he could create a square circle? Is God so powerful that he could create a rock so heavy that he himself couldn't move it? An immovable rock. Is God that powerful? Is God so powerful that he could create, for example, two or more adjacent mountains with no valleys between? Are you sensing the tension that arises with the idea of omnipotence or all power. Could God create existing things that don't exist? Well, let's think this through very carefully. A square is a square, a circle is a circle. These are two different geometric shapes and therefore they are mutually exclusive propositions. God 
cannot create a square circle because, in fact, these are two different things entirely. God can't create two or more adjacent mountains with no valley between because that would be one mountain. You wouldn't have mountains if there were no valley between. I think you get the picture. Things that exist, exist. Things that don't exist, don't exist. Now, we come to scriptures like this one and people tend to just want to throw this at the problem and say problem solved. The, the, the omnipotence paradox is solved by an authoritative statement in chapter 19 and verse 26 of the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus himself says, with men this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Really, Jesus? With God are all things possible? Literally all things? Can God make a square circle? A rock so heavy he can't move it? Can God create entities that both exist and don't exist simultaneously? Well, C.S. Lewis fleshes out the omnipotence paradox in an ingenious way by simply saying that God's omnipotence means power to do all that is intrinsically possible, not to do the intrinsically impossible. I just want you to just rest your mind on this for a moment. To say God is omnipotent is not to say that God can do the logically impossible, the intrinsically impossible. C.S. Lewis goes on and he says, you may attribute miracles to God, but not nonsense. You may attribute miracles to God, but not nonsense. And this is no limiting of God's power, Lewis says. By, by recognizing logical impossibilities or mutually exclusive propositions, a square circle, for example, we're not limiting God's power, Lewis says. If you choose to say God can give a creature free will and at the same time withhold free will from it, you have not succeeded in saying anything about God. This is astounding and not merely astounding, crucial to realize for reasons we are about to realize. Meaningless combinations of words do not suddenly acquire meaning simply because we add the prefix to them, the two word prefix to them, God can. God can create a square circle. Lewis is saying no. That sentence does not acquire meaning simply because you say it's meaningful, right? His point is this. It remains true that all things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. The intrinsic impossibilities are not things, but non-entities. <laughs> I mean, the question is more along the lines of not... Can God do all things, but rather, can God do non-things? Nonsense is nonsense, even when we speak it about God, Lewis says. It is no more possible for God than for the weakest of his creatures to carry out both of two mutually exclusive alternatives. You can't do it, and God can't do it. Not because God lacks omnipotence, but because God operates within the realm of rational, logical possibilities. Not because his power meets an obstacle. That's, what, that's not what prevents God from be able, being able to do these non-things that we imagine. Not because his power meets an obstacle, but because nonsense remains nonsense even when we talk it about God. So there are things that are really more within the category of non-things that God cannot do. And this should not in any way rock our 
perception and our confidence in the power of God. And the reason it's vital to understand this is because once we get past the more trite and simplistic propositions of square circles and, and non-existing things that simultaneously exist, we come to the real crucial issue of understanding the power of God in relation to his character. Because the omnipotence paradox eventually finds its way into the realm of who God is and how he acts in relation to us. An omnipotent God exists, proposition number one, but simultaneously evil exists and all the pain and suffering that goes with it, right? These two things are propositions on the table for our intellectual, rational, logical contemplation. An omnipotent God exists, but evil also exists. So, the natural deduction can be that God is either impotent or evil himself. Because, in fact, if God were omnipotent and God exists, then God would not allow any evil and suffering to exist. The fact that evil and suffering exists must draw us to the conclusion, according to this line of logic, that God either is not omnipotent or God himself is evil. Or, as I'm going to suggest to you, there is another option. But before we get to that option, the concept that we're right now contemplating is articulated by Sam Harris and, in fact, many of the most prominent unbelievers and atheists in the intellectual sphere uh, go to great lengths to present this, what they regard to be a, a philosophically impossible hurdle to surmount for those who believe in God. So Sam Harris, and he was writing this um, after a major tsunami had struck of Asia, and many people were killed, he says either God can do nothing to stop catastrophes like this, like the tsunami, or he doesn't care to, or he doesn't exist. Now, now think through very carefully, Sam Harris is saying here that really only three options exist. Either God can do nothing to stop a tsunami, an earthquake, a car accident, a cancer diagnosis, an act of abuse, rape, murder, war. Either God can do nothing to stop these kinds of things, or he doesn't care to. Or he doesn't care to. Or he doesn't exist. Now, God is either impotent, Harris deduces from this proposition. God is either impotent, that is, he's not all-powerful, He's weak, in fact. Or, if God is omnipotent, but doesn't stop such things from happening, then God is evil. God is not exercising his power to prevent horrible catastrophes from taking place, and therefore, God must be a part of the problem. God himself must be evil if he doesn't stop these things from happening, when in fact he can stop them from happening. Or, Harris driving to his atheist, atheism, says, or God is just imaginary. And then Harris says, take your pick and choose wisely. But the problem is Harris has, has given us only the three options that he imagines are the only three options that exist. And so we are backed into what Harris regards to be a logically uh, incoherent corner theologically. The moment I say I believe in the existence of an omnipotent God, a God of all power, well then, Harris says, you're trapped, logically. Because if such a God exists, well then, no evil and no suffering would exist. What Harris is doing is he's doing something that is often done by people who seek to rule out the existence of God on the premise of the omnipotence paradox. 
but something that also many who believe in God also affirm and they play into the weakness of their own position to believe in God because they fail to understand what's happening at the foundation. And what's happening at the foundation is Harris is operating on the assumption that omnipotence must necessarily equate to omni-control. That if God is omnipotent, if God is all-powerful, well then God necessarily must exercise that power to prevent anything wrong from ever happening. And the moment anything wrong does happen, well, Harris draws the conclusion that God is either, either impotent, evil, or imaginary. But we don't have to land there. What if love, what if love rather than power is God's primary identity? What if we simply introduce onto the table, into the thinking process, the concept, the idea of love, which necessitates freedom? If we say that God is equated with sheer power and nothing else, then maybe Sam Harris's argument holds water. But the moment you say, no, there's something that is more fundamental to God's identity than power. There's something that is more essential to God's character than might. And that is love. The moment you put love on the table, everything changes and a whole new world of understanding begins to open. Think about it like this. If God is love, and I say if because I'm presenting it at this point as a proposition for our consideration, a hypothesis, if you will. Now, I believe that God is love, and I'm driving the theological vehicle of our understanding in that direction. But if God is love, it is logically impossible for God to exercise absolute power over free moral agents. And the moment God does exercise absolute power over free moral agents, God ceases to be love. If God micromanages all outcomes, if he exercises a meticulous control over all outcomes, over everything that happens, then the notion of free moral agency vanishes. We are either machines or slaves at that point. But make no mistake about it, what we are not, we are not free and moral agents capable of love if all that we do is predetermined or controlled by an omnipotent God. If God is love, it is logically impossible for God to exercise exhaustive control over creation. But come with me back to Exodus. Now you remember I said hold on to this idea because here we have the idea that after God has introduced himself in the book of Genesis as the Almighty, repeatedly, six or seven times, in the book of Genesis, God is described with the term Almighty God. But then, as you will recall, God introduces himself in Exodus chapter 6 to Moses, and he says, hey, back there when I introduced myself to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, I introduced myself to them. I appeared to them as God Almighty. That was, that was the form in which I appeared to them. That was the language with which I introduced myself to them. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you want to know who I am? I am God Almighty. That's who I am. And then God says something interesting, as we previously noticed. But, qualifying statement, by my name, Lord, that is Yahweh in the Hebrew, I was not known to them. 
They knew me as Almighty God, but they didn't know me, Moses, in the way I am currently in the process of introducing myself to you. There is what we might call the initial introduction of God in the book of Genesis, in scripture as a whole. And the initial introduction is God is almighty, God is all-powerful. The abstract idea of power. We are mere human beings, created beings, and there's so much that is beyond our comprehension. And when human beings first encounter God, not just Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but you and me and everybody, when we first encounter the notion of God, it is almost a reflex that we associate God with power. God is in control. God is sovereign. Everything happens for a reason. I'm, I'm, I'm going to die when God determines that it's my time to die. We almost immediately and, and naturally associate God with power, and that power that we associate with God, we almost immediately associate with the notion of control, meticulous control over everything that happens. So this is the introduction to God, not only for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but for you and me, for everybody. God is the Almighty. But then we are noticing that there's an expanded introduction by a proper name. The Almighty then says, hey, I'm Yahweh. I have a name. And the word or the name Yahweh is associated with certain, listen, certain attributes or certain characteristics beyond mere power, beyond sheer power. To Moses in Exodus chapter 6, God says, I'm Yahweh, and then the introduction begins to unfold and to develop with detail. Notice this in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. God continuing his self-revelation to Moses. The Lord, he says, and again, that is Yahweh in the Hebrew, Yahweh passed before him, that is before Moses, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Notice, notice attributes, characteristics, traits are being now given to Moses to fill out his picture of God. I am the Almighty. I am Yahweh. As Yahweh, I want you to know that I'm merciful, that I'm gracious, that I'm long-suffering, that I'm abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children, to the third and fourth generation. Parenthetical statement right there. This is through a larger study of Scripture revealed to be God describing not that he arbitrarily punishes the children for the sins of their parents, but that sin is cyclical and it has a half-life, if you will. It plays out generationally, and the effects of one generation's sins or evil deeds affect generations to come, about three to four generations going forward. But the point is this. Now, this God who to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was simply the Al Almighty, and then to Moses introduced by the name Yahweh, and then Yahweh, a name that is filled with characteristics, God describes himself to Moses as a God of certain relational dynamics. God acts in a certain way in relation to us, to his creation. And the description we just read, 
if it were to be summarized, is something like a combination of balance and equilibrium between mercy and justice. We just noticed that God said to Moses, Hey Moses, I am a God of mercy, I'm gracious, I'm kind, I'm long-suffering, and I forgive. But guilt will not be completely cleared if sin continues because the principle of justice will play itself out in God's creation because God is not only merciful, but just. Are you tracking with me? So then we have the introduction of God in the flesh. In the New Testament, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now we have before us the ultimate self-revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. The New Testament is full of language to the effect that if you have seen me, Jesus says, you have seen the Father. If you want to know what God is like, Jesus is God's self-revelation. God, Hebrews chapter 1 says, in various ways and at different times, down through the ages, has spoken to us through the prophets, but has in these last days spoken to us through his Son, who is the brightness of his glory and the express or the exact image of God's person. So, the Bible reveals a kind of unfolding revelation from God as the Almighty to God as Yahweh to God as long-suffering and gracious and good and kind and just to God on full display in the person of Jesus Christ until finally the pinnacle expression of God's character is brought to us in the cross of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18, Paul says the message of the cross, that is the self-sacrificing love of God manifested in Christ giving his life, that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It makes no logical sense to the human mind for God to be omnipotent for God to be all-powerful and yet to come into the world and to voluntarily give his life, to suffer and to die. But Paul says this message of the gospel, the message of the cross, while it is foolishness to the human mind in its natural state, Paul says, but to us who are being saved... It is the power of God. And there's our word again. The power of God. The cross of Calvary is a revelation of God's power. God is omnipotent, we learn in Scripture. But then we are presented with the omnipotence paradox. If God is omnipotent, well, why does anything ever go wrong in God's world or universe? Why doesn't God with his omnipotence just prevent all bad outcomes from occurring? Well, because as our awareness of God's character and identity expands, we realize that not only is God omnipotent, God is good. And God's essential goodness is the principle that mitigates the exercise of his power, or you might say, determines how God exercises his power. And ultimately, how has God exercised his power? God voluntarily died for us at the cross of Calvary. In Jesus, we realize that God's omnipotence, when played out to its ultimate expression is self-sacrificing love. So God voluntarily dies for us as his ultimate act of maximum power, according to Paul. Not according to me, 
Not, not according to you. We're not making this up, but according to Scripture. The Apostle Paul, in retrospect, looks back at the entire Old Testament narrative. Paul is biblically literate. He's a student of the Old Testament scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. He knows that God introduced himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the Almighty. He knows also that God introduced himself to Moses as Yahweh, who is good and merciful and long-suffering. That God's power is exercised for purposes of goodness, not merely for purposes of control. So God voluntarily lays down his life for you and me in the person of Christ. And at first glance, this looks like a display of weakness. At first glance, it looks like a display of defeat. And this is why Paul says to the natural human mind, it looks foolish. It looks ludicrous. Really? Are you going to tell me that the almighty God of the universe is the one hanging there on that cross? Torn, bleeding, dying? The idea is almost impossible for us to wrap our minds around because we reflexively associate power with control. And wherever we see a lack of micromanaging, meticulous control, we are prone to draw the conclusion that God is impotent, that he doesn't have power. But what if, what if the most powerful power in all the universe is the power of love, not control. What if God's voluntary act of self-sacrifice is precisely the most maximum manifestation of God's power because it draws and attracts us voluntarily back to him under no control? What if God's love is the most powerful influence in the universe because it changes me at the level of my heart. Well, the Bible, as we have seen ever so briefly, and scripture is full of this idea, and once you see it, it becomes apparent everywhere. The Bible is an expanding narrative that builds in clarity to a point of maximum brilliance. And that maximum point of brilliance is Christ. And the pinnacle of the Christ event is Calvary. When Jesus dies on the cross, we are face to face with the most luminous, brilliant revelation of the character of God that the universe has ever seen. What looks like weakness is really strength. But here's the thing. Human beings move through stages of development. You do, I do, Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Isaiah, Daniel, Peter, Paul. All human beings move through stages of mental and emotional and perceptual development. We all begin as children in our understanding of God. You can be a 25-year-old child in your, your theological grasp of who God is. We all begin as children in our perception of God. And as we come to God, it doesn't matter if we come to God when we're 60 or 20 or whatever the age may be, biologically, the fact is that we're all children when we first encounter God. And God is, at first consideration, a figure of authority for us. There's a, a security in the idea that, quote-unquote, God is in control. 
There's an understandable security in the notion that God meticulously controls all events and outcomes. Because if, if God is merely an authority figure who exercises exhaustive control over everything, then on a subconscious level, I can let all responsibility for all outcomes rest with God. But as I grow and mature into spiritual and moral adolescence, I begin to see God as a figure of freedom. I begin to understand God as, as a God who desires my freedom so much that he chooses not to exercise exhaustive control over me. And at the adolescent stage of moral development, well, it's tricky, it's risky, because the moment a human being begins to realize that they have freedom in relationship to God, well, then the risk factor emerges, and I might use my freedom to presume upon the grace and mercy of God and experience a kind of adolescent, teenage, spiritual rebellion of sorts. Some of you have been through that. Some of you are going through that right now. You've just begun to realize that you're not under the dominating control of God, and you are experimenting with your freedom, even as you continue to follow Jesus. But then, we become spiritual adults. We mature into moral adulthood. And we begin to realize that God is a figure of attraction. That, in fact, my freedom is most fully realized when I allow myself to be voluntarily attracted to God. Not because he's more powerful than I am, but because he's good, because he's beautiful, because God is attractive. If you want a God of absolute control, eventually that theological path is going to come to a dead end. If you want a God of absolute control, Yahweh will not meet your expectations. The Yahweh God of Scripture will not meet your expectations. For a while, you will be able to operate within the paradigm of God is in control and nothing happens that God did not predetermine. For a while, you will be comfortable operating within the concrete, narrow parameters that nothing happens except for what God wants to happen, that everything happens for a reason, but eventually, you're going to begin to feel an uneasiness with that paradigm, with that narrow defining of God in terms of sheer power and control. If you want a God of absolute control, well, Yahweh will not meet your expectations. Ultimately, he will surpass your expectations. Because the Yahweh God of Scripture does not have his, his heart set upon you for control. The fact is that if there's one thing that God doesn't want, it's control. If there's one thing Yahweh does not want for you and me, it's for him to exercise a meticulous, absolute control over us. He didn't make us for that. He designed us for maximum freedom because he designed us for maximum flourishing. So what do we get with the God of Scripture? What God wants is that we would grow up into majestic, creatures of responsible self-governance who do what is right 
because it is right and purely for love as the guiding motive. There is no higher state of existence, in fact, than to be utterly and completely free to do what you want and to want to do what God wants you to do because you see rational, logical, beautiful sense in God's ways. Is God on a power trip? Well, in a sense, yes. He is on a power trip that is navigating you and me in relation to him to a place where the one power, the only power, that ultimately defines who he is in our eyes and who we are in relation to him is the power of love. God is on a power trip because he is seeking to gain access to your heart and mine by the power of his love. I invite you, I urge you to pause and to think about the glorious and beautiful potential of growing up past childhood and adolescence into a full-blown mature spiritual adulthood in which God is beautiful in your eyes and you don't have to serve him, but rather you want to. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the good God that you are and for the progressive unfolding revelation of your character in scripture. We love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen.